remember the first time I heard about this film, which was during the inquest um, into Mark's killing. And I remember going in to see one of the police officers give his testimony. I think it was the police officer who was in charge of the operation on that day. And the, uh, he was being cross-examined, and in the questioning he was asked, so what are the lessons that we can learn from the killing of Mark Duggan? What, what went wrong on the day? You know, what lessons can we learn from what went wrong? And the police officer looked slightly confused, and he looked back at the, uh, the lawyer cross-examining him, and he said, what went wrong? Mm. Nothing went wrong. And the lawyer said, well, you know, a man is dead. There's been civil unrest across the country. We don't even know if this person deserves to die. There's, you know, we're having an inquest into it. And his response was very casual, and he said, everything went absolutely to plan. And I think that what this film did was it brought a humanity to Mark Duggan that was really lacking from the police operation and their approach, and the state and the press as well. And I think that that part of the inquest really, for me, nailed, put, hit the nail on the head in terms of the attitude that the state had to Mark and his life. And I think that what that film, this film really does is reverse that in a really moving and fantastic way. And I think that's, for me, that was the, the most poignant reflection that I personally had for the film. And I just wanted to share that as, as chair. Um, Leon, what, what did you make of it? Well, it's interesting that you think that because we certainly, um, together, um, George, Marcus, Curtis, um, certainly Marcus and Curtis, and they can speak for themselves, of course, um, wanted to make it for, I think, pretty much that um, reason. And as far as I know, George decided to assist in making this film so that Marcus and Curtis could have a voice and to express the, the very thing you just speak of. Uh, Marcus, did you want to share anything about, about the film? Um, yeah, the, um, <coughs> before making the film, obviously, um, it was put in the media that Mark was in a shootout, he was a gangster, he was all these sort of stuff. So, um, obviously, being a loyal friend that I am to him, I just felt I needed to defend him in some sort of way. So, I said to uh, me and Curtis had a conversation one evening, and we said, we need to put something out there that kind of shows who Mark is as a person, you get me? Because what they're, how they're portraying him is not that guy. It was a general conversation and then um, through Curtis's mum, I think Curtis's mum was, was at um, an event and I think George might have been there or something like that. And um, I think they were discussing the riots and whatever or not. And um, I think he said that he went to do something on the riots and then a, a woman named Yana said that she made no two guys that she she could put him in contact with. And then through Curtis, obviously, we linked George. He came and saw me at um, Hammersmith Hospital where I was working at the time. And um, yeah, Curtis says, yeah, man, I've got this guy, man, he's a director, like, he makes movies and all this stuff, you get me? I'm gonna bring him down to meet you, so. And he's, when I've seen George, you get me? I've just seen this guy in the little rucksack and the little push bike. I'm thinking, you just, just, you know, I know director. <laughs> I don't know the director, you get me? So I was slightly arrogant towards him, you get what I'm saying? But anyway, we went, we've gone into the canteen, sat down, kind of kind of told him, yeah, that's so I want to do this, I want to do like a movie or something, you get me? That kind of, about the riots and what happened to Mark and so on and so forth. And he kind of said he doesn't really do movies and specializes in um, documentaries and stuff. And then kind of just asked me what happened. So, um, I started to explain to him what happened, I kind of got emotional, because obviously you're having to think, innit? So obviously when you're thinking about the situation, it's like, it kind of just made me a little bit upset. So then, um, just by the end of, of explaining what happened on, 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 on that night there, he just said, well, you know what, there's a lot of drama that you've told me about, that I think that we can film. But I didn't really understand what he meant by that. So um, I think a couple of days after that, he's come and linked me with a camera, and um, <coughs> said, we're just doing that. Like, he was doing like a lot of observational for me. You get me? Well, I couldn't understand what he was trying to do, because I'm saying, this, this is not about me. You get me? Like, it's about Mark. Anyway, we continued, continued, continued. You get me? And he's, he's kind of telling me his, his vision, but I, I couldn't really see it. And then, um, I think I'm, I, got, I got sent to prison, obviously. I've come out, he's shown me a trailer, and I kind of was put off from what I saw. I don't know, man, it just frightened me a little bit. You get me? Because, um, 
I was out of sync for about a year with all the filming and all that. And then um, from seeing the trailer, he sent me like, he invited me into the um, studio and then he showed me like a rough cut of the whole thing. And then, um, yeah, between me and you, like, it made me cry. I thought, wow, like, is this what you've done, yeah? And I saw his vision and I said, yeah, man, this is powerful, you get me? And the rest is history, man. I mean, I think in some sense, the beauty of this film is that um, it answers the question that a lot of people was asking five years ago. Why is it that some places erupt and some places don't erupt? Is that some places have a history, a brooding history of oppressive policing, of deaths in community. We know on Broadwell Farm, it goes back to 1985 and the murder of um, Cynthia Jarrett, the killing of Joy Gardner, the killing of Roger Sylvester, the killing of Mark Duggan, and lo and behold, it didn't even end there. They came back. They killed Jermaine Baker the other day. So for some reason, T Tottenham seems to be a place and a space where the police take police into the nth degree. And I think what this film goes to some way to show you is that there's a resilient community there and that these guys are born into this. They didn't create it. They're victims, and they're victimized by a system that doesn't want to understand them. You know, interesting fact, the Running Me Trust has released a report on um, ethnic inequalities in London. Lo and behold, having gay council is the second worst for addressing ethnic inequalities. This has been ongoing for the last 20 years since they started to collect the data. So really, the local authority are letting down our community by not helping to narrow that gap. And in not helping to narrow the gap, they're allowing young people to be born to fall through the gap. And then when they live certain lifestyles, they want to punish them and remove them from the streets. And now what we're seeing, we've, we've had those uprisings, and now what we're seeing is gentrification. So another way of removing them from the streets by the back door. I think it was interesting what you said about the police officers saying it was a perfect operation. That's called the police infallibility syndrome where they never accept they're wrong. They never believe they're wrong. It's not just against our community. The other day you saw that um, the Guildford Four, or the, sorry, the Birmingham Six were gonna get a, 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 a inquest now. And that's after they got found not guilty, this is almost 30 years ago, the police said, well, we're not gonna investigate, inferring that they're the right people. And now there's some evidence that shows that the police knew all along. And then we talk about Hillsborough where they con the whole entire world, and then you talk about Plebgate. But somehow they're enabled to get away with this police infallibility mentality and syndrome and why the society buys into it. This film kind of challenges this, and this film also shows that those that they try to dismiss as feral young youth are not feral. They're born into this environment, they have ambition, they have hope. It's about the opportunity to be able to do something, and better those that criticise create those opportunities than keep on oppressing young people and denying them a right to have any inspiration and aspiration in this place. Okay. In, ter in terms of young people being angry, I think um, that's a good thing. You should be angry. Because you're being sold a lot of um, crap and bull about living in a post-racist society. You only have to look at the Brexit vote. And that doesn't mean that everyone who voted for Brexit is necessarily a racist, but you saw the kind of um, um, campaign the people who clearly were racist were running to encourage others who may have some of that in their DNA to vote similarly to them. What young people need to do is to come together. You need to help. I mean, we got to take some responsibility for not maybe leaving some films behind so that you understand the past. But you need to understand your past. You need to come together, support each other. Don't be left. But don't be led by no left wing or no left wingers. The left wingers can't lead you. They're only going to lead you to a place that they want to go. That's not a place where we need to be. We need to come together, old and young, to start to decide for ourselves how we hold this system properly to account and how we start to create organizations and institutions that will enable our young to grow and develop.
because at the moment they're actually not doing that. In terms of the brother who says, are we right to think that it's a good thing that five people lost their lives in this state? Actually, we're not right, but it's totally understandable because we can't keep on being the ones who get killed all the time. We can't be the ones who are always dying. I mean, do you notice, it's not only that the brothers got killed. This is what the BBC did. They showed you a brother getting killed right up. Bang, bang, bang. Showed you him taking his last breath. They showed you another brother in the car whilst, him, whilst his girlfriend is talking about, I'm gonna put this on Facebook, and they showed you him bleeding out. When it came to the coppers, they said, scenes too, too yeah. shocking to show, okay? So even in those moments, they still show that somehow our lives are somehow less valuable than others' lives. I don't think that anybody's life is less valuable than anybody else's. So I don't take joy when I see those moments, but I understand them. And I do understand what you're saying, brother. If a system can't give us justice, if a system is gonna close ranks every time these incidents happen, then there has to come a point where the system has to be told that you're not the only judge on this planet. You have to be able to feel what we felt. That's what we wanted from Broadwell Farm in 1985. We hoped that what happened on that estate that day would stop any other person ever from dying from these police community relationships and dying in police custody. But unfortunately, the same thing, that police infallibility thing, it won't stop it. Unfortunately, we have to do more than that. And it means that all of us have to get up and understand one thing. Being black means one thing in this time, that we all must be prepared to make some sacrifice. And that's what we're not doing. And that's what we have to do. And all of you go to university, you're actually now what we call privileged young people. I'm talking about to the black kids here. What you all need to do is keep the links with the estates, okay? The left don't do it, nobody else does it. We can't leave them isolated and marginalized. You can't be, have a revolution unless you bring those who are at the bottom with you. So keep the links with the estates. Let's help them, let's find those rough diamonds, polish them and help them to shine and grow. Yeah, uh, <clears throat> to answer your question, um, you know, uh, you know. First and foremost, my uh, my role is as a, a filmmaker and director, so, and a, a lot of the camera work that I did as well. So, you know, you're you're not objective because I don't believe in objective, you know, camera work and filmmaking. The only objective camera work is CCTV, <laughs> not objective at all, <laughs> subjective. But at the same time, you know, when Marcus is on his way to prison and he starts crying, it's not my job to put the camera down and, and put my arm around him. Or, you know, if Curtis is racing the red car, I'm not supposed to put the camera down and say, yeah, yeah, he's gaining on you, you know, speed up. <laughs> <laughs> That's not really the idea. But, you know, as far as how personally involved I got, the thing is with Marcus and Curtis is they're family-orientated people. And what I realised quite quickly was for them to trust me then, they had to sort of regard me somewhat as a family member. And, you know, for me to be filming Curtis, for instance, on Christmas Day, you know, basically what, in short, you know, I found myself quite quickly more than I've ever been in making a documentary sort of, you know, like personally involved, to answer your question. But um, I don't think I was ever uh, as personally involved with the film or in, in a sense sort of emotional because there's, you know, there's an objective, which is just to make the film. Because my responsibility, and uh, as I felt, my uh, duty was to honour the trust they gave me by making the film and finishing the film. So, um, you know, I don't know if that, that answers your question, but, you know, in terms of personal involvement, I probably felt more personally involved when, you know, listening to the radio a couple of, of, of days ago and listening to the this seismic discrepancy between the way the media reported um, you know, the, um, the deaths of those five policemen compared to the way the two African-American deaths were reported. I, I was hearing things like national disgrace and, you know, a nation in mourning. And I was like, well, why weren't you saying that two days ago? I just felt incensed. And um, I'm so glad we have a Martin Luther King quote in our film which says, a right is a language of unheard. Because I believe if Martin Luther King was alive today, he would also say, 
a sniper on a rooftop is the language of the unheard. <laughs> and it's not that Martin Luther King would have endorsed that, but he was just pointing out a certain logic uh, uh, in terms of an escalation of violence. And he was talking about humanity, because the same man also said that an eye for an eye leaves everyone blind. Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, I don't, at the risk of sounding repetitive, you know, I just think, you know, a riot is a language of the unheard, you know, um, but, uh, you know, you, you, we made a film, and the, the reason we were able to make a film was because Marcus and Curtis and Stafford were, were you know, wanted to make a, you know, as a joint, joint enterprise in that sense, and it's, it's an alternative, you know, to, um, and uh, you know what we're doing now is 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 a, is a dialogue around the film and the themes that it raises. So we're talking. Uh, last week we had a screening at which, to my left, was sitting uh, Victor Lisi, who, who was a borough commander of um, in Tottenham. And you can believe a lot of very robust questions were 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 targeted towards the officer on that evening, and that was on Thursday you know, Thursday evening, so people were angry. But my feeling was it was a good thing because I think um, he's also di doing diversity now. So that, as far as I was concerned, was direct communication and dialogue and material that he can then take back and uh, hopefully, it, you know, work with his fellow officers to start to implement in their practice. And it's just a feeling of, I felt, that was Thursday night, and I just felt, well, you know, if we're not doing things like this, then, the alternative is, is what happened on Friday morning, whenever it happened. With again going back to a, someone on a rooftop, you know, with with a rifle, and that that's 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 the alternative to I think what we're trying to achieve with this film. We we also discussed with the police um, when you know about, and we certainly plan to show it um, to various police ranks. But um, on Thursday, we discuss you know, this notion of what Stafford speaks of, infallibility, and what is happening. I mean, just to answer the young woman's question about policing, um, the question about how police close ranks and how they're not questioning themselves and how they're not fleshing out you know, and giving up people who are um, corrupt in the force. And, and you know, we just hope that a tool like this I guess if it's you know it's shown to police, they can look at it and and because um, I think anyway with Victor Lisa, he, the film did strike something with him. I mean he would you know he would you know to see the humanity. So I mean I think that's the best thing we can do as filmmakers is to you know bring about a, a, a film which um, you know speaks to the truth really because certainly it's it you know the media uh, uh, classically television these days isn't really doing that, I don't think, anyway. It's not providing this holistic kind of notion. It's, it, you know, so that's where we come in as independent filmmakers. We're hoping that we can give voice to, to truth. Um, and I think that's what everyone feels when they watch this film. And, and they certainly, I don't, I'm not sure if they're feeling that when they watch certain films like Benefit Street or, you know, films like that you know but um so yeah that's uh, so hopefully in terms of the police we plan to show it um to them and also to and the idea is that it, the film will be released in cinemas from the 15th and the idea is we, we, we screen it we screen it to to the british public because this is also a matter in terms of how young men like Marcus and Curtis and you know Mark is perceived in society and um, and so the idea is to to to, to, to rehumanize well, I think the film has done what people wanted it to do it answers the question why do some areas kick off when others doesn't it has audiences like itself to stick stick around to um have the discussion so that there's a different level of insight into what happened in 2011, especially what happened for us and with us at Tottenham Police Station. But to answer the sister's question about 
could riots happen again? Absolutely, we stopped one in January in Tottenham after they shot Jermaine Baker. And then they got together with their mates in the media and started peddling and creating stories about Jermaine Baker being a member of a gang called Bloodlines, a gang that didn't exist, and then linking that gang to a dead person, someone who had been killed four years earlier, linking that gang to Mark Duggan. And we called a meeting and we um, put the police and the IPCC on the spot in a way that we wasn't able to in 2011. And we stopped him, we calmed community tensions. But the environment is out there at all times. And you hear um, Boris, who didn't get the job, he had, he had some um, water cannons hidden out in Kent, ready to bring in a moment's notice. Imagine if that guy had become police. We hear them saying that they're going to give 400 officers firearms. And those officers happen to be those really nice, sensitive, cool characters who hang about in vans and call themselves the territorial support group. The very group of officers that we had issues with in 1976 when the first riots in Notting Hill and there was called the Special Patrol Group actually <coughs> kicked off. So we, we see that they don't learn. What they try to do is, is strengthen their position so that next time it will be better. The only thing I think that really has stopped any riots or uh, um, uprisings, what rebellions, whatever one you call them, the only thing that's really stopped it is CCTV cameras. That's what saved them the last time round, and that's what, that's, that's what helped convict Marcus, and that's what young people know. But the anger's there, the frustration's there, and it's just going to take something to destroy the brace, the camel's back. And we may see some of those scenes that we saw in 2011 all over again. That, when I went to see Mick Lease, it was, it was an idea. And obviously, um, it's a hard process because you have to contact the Home Office and stuff like that, and it, it just became something difficult. But it's an idea that's still on the table. And I mean, um, doing that is it's, it's solely for the youth, you get me? So, so they see, you get me, like what life is like in prison and, and speak to inmates in there, you get me? So it kind of puts them off puts them off getting involved in anything that would make them end up there, you feel me? But um, I haven't really, I haven't really, um, what's the, like I haven't really about, about the animal done enough. The, the police and young people. Yeah, obviously it's still there, isn't it? Nothing can change, you get me, that the kids feel frightened. I mean, I still do, you get me, I'm walking down the road, you get me, I'm not, doing, I'm not involved in nothing, but just when you see the police, you get that boom, boom, boom in your heart, you get what I'm saying? Because you don't know, they're gonna pull you up and go in your pocket, so I'd, lie and say, yeah, you fit the description of some incident that happened down the road. You get what I'm saying? Like, we still go through that. Even as big men, we still go through that. You get what I'm saying? So the hostility is still there. But, um, yeah, I'm just trying to, reach out to these, I'm trying to reach out to these kids and show them that life's bigger than, bigger than what, what, what they look at you as. You understand? And just help them reach their true potential. Like George has helped me, you understand, through this film. I don't know if that answers your question. Anyone want to question, um, answer the question, comment on white privilege? Um, yeah, um, I mean, white privilege is a, is a reality, isn't it? It's um, why society has always been in denial about our disadvantage and always in denial about their privilege. Thing is, is you have to understand that most <laughs> white folk that are alive today don't understand the history know less about the history than even we do. They want to believe that they live in a world that is built on meritocracy. So that they're in the driving seat because they learn how to drive first. We say it's because you actually stole the car from us and the invention. And the but they have to understand that. I mean, there was that program recently, Britain's Secret Slave Owners. Now, that's a program that everybody should have been forced to watch. And they stuck it away on BBC Two. It would have been helpful if people saw that and learned about it. Every prime minister since Gladstone invested in own slaves, every institution, everyone. And again, I've had a go at the left today, so let me also remind the left, because I'm fed up with them, I've heard so much from them, and just recently, 
They kind of sold us down the swanny, right? And let me tell them, capitalism was actually built on the back of slavery. So it doesn't start with capitalism, it started way before that. And that's with imperialism, which is what breeds <coughs> the sense and notion of privilege. But we as black people, we have to stand up to it, not give in to it, not accept it, challenge it, identify it and call it out. We have to do that. We also have to know our history, teach our young our history, and also help everybody else to understand the history, to see how those benefits still go on today. Go and check out Dr. Joy DeGroy Leary, talking about post-traumatic slave syndrome, and see how the negative impacts, the enduring legacy, is still with us today, to understand the privilege that some people have and enjoy and take for granted. It's a reality and we have to um, do all we can to change it, but nothing will change until we do. A uh, quick reference, um, if anyone wants to uh, read more about the history of capitalism in relation to slavery, there's a book called, a guy called Eric Williams, who was the first Prime Minister of Trinidad, so he wrote a book called Capitalism and Slavery. It's about how the roots of capitalism are, are entrenched in enslavement. I recommend you all go out and read that as well. Um, and the other thing I, um, I'll abuse quickly as chair is that we often think of racism as being something that happens in Mississippi or something that happens in Johannesburg. And that's because Britain historically has often done its racism abroad. It does its racism in Jamaica. It does its racism in Kenya, in the Mau It does its racism in India. And so we often forget that although it was doing it in other places in the world, it was all being governed right here in the center of empire. <laughs>
as opposed to a kind of a documentary where you're just kind of adding information. So it wasn't, it was never informational documentary. Um, just to add, to speak about the outreach, um, we will, we're on a roadshow. So over the next um, few weeks, we'll be going across um, uh, the UK and, um, and I believe Interfilm um, is involved. Um, they're, they're a group that gets involved with um, young people. So we're doing that as well. On the 6th of August this year, we're going to be remembering the fifth anniversary of the riots and the fifth anniversary of the shooting of Mark Duggan. You'll all be welcome in Tottenham. We'll be having a vigil outside Tottenham Police Station. We'll be out there the same time that we went five years ago. We'll be leaving from Broadwalk Farm. You'll all be welcome. And the first thing you'll see that we do is we're going to borrow some electricity from inside the police station, set up our little system. And the first local rap artist that we're going to put on the stage, the first thing he's going to say is, this is the silence of the Lammy, okay? Okay? We have that every year. He's got, he's got a wicked rap going down too, the silence of the Lammy, because we're not going to put someone on TV who's not really going to be saying anything. On the night of the riots, Lammy phoned me. He said to me, would I do TV with him in the next morning? I said, of course. I said, it depends. What are you saying? And this is what Lammy said to me. They killed him. They fucking killed him. And the next morning, I saw this this guy on telly, okay? Standing next to Sharon Grant, the widow, the wife of Bernie Grant, right? Our hero, the only ever politician who got out, who came out and said, listen, I'm not gonna say they shouldn't have done it, I understand why they do it. Lammy came there and said, they burned down Tottenham. And when everyone said, who burned down Tottenham? He said, some people from outside Tottenham. So he wouldn't even take responsibility for what was going on. And then he said he wrote a book, and that's what, turned us all off. Within two weeks, he wrote a book. What? Nothing to do with the riots. <laughs> Nothing to do with the riots. Didn't tell young people. I mean, he likes to say, I came from Tottenham. Like, we didn't know him. You know him? <laughs> right? Didn't tell people, nothing to tell people how you escaped from Tottenham like he did. Nothing. Nothing. I actually had to um, do an analysis of his book, and I ended up saying, listen, he's just like the rioters that he criticised. He said that they were opportunists, but this is bloody opportunism at uh, its absolute worst. Okay? In terms, in, in terms, in terms of, in terms of, in terms of, um, I like that term, inf infiltrating the institutions. You think when you go there, they're going to see that you're black? <laughs> okay? There's no infiltrating the inf institutions. The biggest, the biggest myth. The biggest load of crap that we ever got sold in this country was that representation would make a difference. What a load of crap that is. What a load of crap that is when we're represented at the bottom. The police is a hierarchical institution. Nobody joins the police as a PC and changes the police. Nobody does. They told us, vote for people to go into parliament. Hello, those people can't even represent us. The minute we go back to the people we vote for, they say, actually, we're we, we have to represent our, const our constituents. We can't just talk black. Hey, if I keep on talking black, they're going to think I'm black and it's not going to work for us. <laughs> right? Rep this notion that representation makes a difference is, 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 is a con. We need to be around the decision-making table. And we need to decide with these institutions what is and what isn't institutionally racist. If they did it unwittingly, they can't sit there now and cleanse themselves of it. And that's what the Metropolitan Police want to tell us that they've done. And we know that it's not true. We need to be in there helping them to clean up their policies and their practices. But not as officers, not as foot soldiers that they can order and rule, but at the decision-making table where we can make the changes that need to be made. Any final, any final thoughts? I can't thoughts? follow that. Like, <laughs> what, what more needs to be said? Please, please. Sorry, I'm just going to plug the film, really. Um, I mean, of course, it's an important film, so do tell your friends and family. Absolutely. Um, and um, the uh, Twitter page and f Facebook, uh, Marcus, what's the Facebook page? The Hard Stop Film. The Hard, Hard Stop Film. And the Twitter handle is at The Hard Stop. Very easy to... And, yeah, please do share. I mean, we've... 
essentially we really want to make more films like this and, um, and also need to pick up David Somerset African Odyssey program. Um, they've been around for a long time and they support um, uh, films coming up. Tell them he'll be showing in Tottenham on the 6th of August in a way that only Tottenham can do it. I promise you all.